will now bring to you various contributions from partners and civil society organizations from across the West African sub-region. Welcome to the second day of the official launch of the Regional Citizens Dialogue Program, RCPG, on preventing and responding to all constitutional changes of government in West Africa, holding here in Abuja, Nigeria, it's really an honor for me, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to welcome colleagues from different parts of the continent, uh, from Senegal, um, from uh, Sierra Leone, from Gambia, from uh, you know different parts of, of the continent, as I've said, from Nigeria, of course, different parts of Nigeria, from Ghana, and all from you know all gathered here to discuss what has obviously become a very serious problem uh, for us on the continent. As Transnational Civil Society Network, Wanderlust brings together CSOs from across the ECOWAS region, numbering about 45 organizations, with the aim of building bridges of solidarity and common purpose. By so doing, Wanderlust mobilizes collective voices and resources to promote, support, and defend participatory people-centered governance and democratic development in the ECOWAS region. Uh, for those of you who might not be very familiar with ECOSOC, uh, we are the um, we are an advisory organ of the African Union uh, with a specific mandate, uh, which is to promote uh, civil society participation uh, in the work of the union. And so we serve as a bridge between uh, the union as a whole and uh, the African citizenry. Uh, with regard to this um, to this program, this project, I think is really quite important um, that when you read the title, um, it's aiming at both prevention and response. Uh, because I think that perhaps over the course of our efforts, uh, maybe we have been a little bit biased towards uh, the response and a little less so to the preventative aspect. And so I think it's really quite important uh, that we've made this quite clear. We are so happy because uh, it has been a worrying issue with respect to what is happening in West Africa, especially the unconstitutional change in government. And as a political party, we have been deliberating and trying to come up with procedures and um, policies on how to overcome the challenges. So when this um, invitation came, we were so glad that um, the problem that had been worrying us, there is a solution to it. And that is why today we are part and parcel of this forum and as a council we will do everything that we need to do especially with formulation of policies and if there's anything we can do with respect to the parliament we are ready to do that and we have already sent messages to all the political parties and the, a lot of our members in the national assembly you know they're waiting for us to bring the news and the concepts and the papers the framework so that we are able to integrate it into our policies in order to resolve this issue. Because that is a major challenge in West Africa. And that is a major challenge for Nigeria. And we thank all of you. I will so much believe that at the end of the day, we will come up with a paper, with a policy, with a concept that will help us to move forward. Some of the presentation you will see uh, as we do, relates to the work ECOSOC has been doing at the continental level. And thanks to my uh, friend and brother now, <laughs> Augustine, when we attended two or three years ago the first uh, uh, Continental Dialogue, Citizen Dialogue Forum, which was facilitated by ECOSOC and APRM, the African Peer Review Mechanism, and others. It was then we started to see, after the outcome, no, no, us, I would say, how do we translate that on the ground? Because at the end of the day, ECOSOC, we facilitate those dialogues, but the recommendations out of that was meant to translate those recommendations 
on the ground. And West Africa being the epicenter of unconstitutional change of government. And at the moment, I'm also serving as uh, the chairman of the AU Echoes of Peace and Security Cluster. So on the continent, I represent that. But I thought that home is home. The ECOWAS communities are home. We should make sure that we translate, uh, mobilize civil society to uh, ensure that we complement the efforts of head of states and government. So this presentation, next slide, is a short one. Uh, as I say, what is the purpose? The purpose is simply to present Next, the purpose is simply to present a brief summary of what this program looks like and uh, to seek the views, feedback, comments, inputs, suggestions from participants on the structure and outline of the content of the program. And the expected outcome is simply for you to build a consensus that this is a good program. I think it will be able to uh, respond to, uh, to, to work towards a preventive strategy as well as responsive strategy from the voice of uh, civil citizens and civil society. Next. So this is the structure. Because what we want to do is simply to give you how it looks like. As I say, the French version, which has been translated, will come. Because we do not want to circulate document when this is a regional entity. Then the Francophone colleagues who are sitting in Bamako, Mali, I know a lot of them, and uh, Burkina and Niger, they are watching now. I mean, all those colleagues who are part of our, this analysis are also accredited to the Fourth General Assembly of the, Af the ECOSOC uh, framework. So they are waiting and watching, and I'm sure uh, they are looking exactly what uh, uh, we are trying to do here. So the structure is outlined. The first section of the program document looks at the general background with Professor Mosley and uh, my, uh, Azu, and then the DG. And NIPS have also emphasized, we don't need to rehearse that so that we waste time. That is the problematic, the analysis of where are we coming from, why after two decades we have seen the, the upswitch or the emergence of uh, unconstitutional change of government in our... Then we have the rationale for the program, the problems and challenges we expect to solve, and then the short summary of the, pro the program. Next. Now, the... Uh, the approach and methodology we have adopted in the design of the program line in that section. Number three, they will clearly define the overall goal of this program and then what the strategic objectives and because remember our job is civil society, but how do we ensure that we complement and reinforce the work that the, the ECOWAS is doing, the African Union and other entities? Next slide. So this is the five pillars, I think. This is change. Before we come to the pillars, can you go back to the slides? That's the, the slides I gave you, they are not there. This comes last. Yeah. This is terms of reference. Why is who is working on the slide? Yes. So the fourth uh, uh, section looks at the, the pillars of the program intervention. And what we have tried to do here, as I did, is uh, we are mirroring and aligning our program intervention based on the last year, the African Governance Report. 2023, which was facilitated and published by the African Peer Review Mechanism. And we are happy Professor Adisa is here. We're expecting Dr. Mike Bryden to have been here soon, but maybe due to flight delays, he's not here from the, sec the APRM Secretariat in, in South Africa. So what we have done, we are not reinventing the wheel. The analysis, the report of last year, which was published in Nairobi at the Media Head of State Summit, outlined five areas of where the analysis and research was done. One, uh, promoting constitutional order and state legitimacy. Two, 
preserving the integrity of ele national electoral processes. Then number three, how do we enhance diversity management, human rights interventions? Then four, promoting uh, this which four should be uh, economic governance and accountability. And then the last one, how do we contribute to the uprising and military intervention and terrorism, especially the role of our diaspora, the African diaspora, how will we tap on the African diaspora to influence, to work on dialogue on uh, the issue of external influence and interference onto the peace, stability, and political inheritance onto this. Next slide. Then we'll look at the, the program document also maintain the implementation arrangement, the management structure and oversight mechanism, which we will be discussing today, the steering committee and then the monitor and evaluation, the risks and mitigations, and the theory of change. Now, in terms of financing, this is what is outlined there. So that's the program document. Next. And then it will have the annex, the logical framework, with so many indicators and benchmarks have been outlined as well. Now, in terms of the background, just to give you an idea of what's in the document, we have clearly said the AU and ECOWAS have clear mandate, are mandated to promote democracy, good governance in West Africa and on the continent as a whole. And these mandates are outlined in several nomadic instruments and policy instruments. The Constitutive Act of the AU, the ECOWAS Protocol, and then in, in terms of unconstitutional change of government, we have the Lome Declaration, and the, the Lome Declaration, which was adopted in 2000, uh, clearly uh, um, outlined how AU particularly, and ECOWAS Rex could respond to issues around unconstitutional change of government. We also have within the African Charter on Democracy, Election and Good Governance, provisions that may clearly define instruments, actions that the AU and ECOWAS can take. If we have about sanctions, we have about uh, other, uh, whether suspension and human, humanitarian sanctions, they are all outlined into this document. And then we, the, the, the good information is that, yes, these normative frameworks are there, but the challenge is unconstitutional change of government, as we see, has increasingly become a monumental tax, especially for us in the region. Our ambition, 2050, I'm happy my brother is here. The ECOWAS vision of the people in 2050, how can we realize that? And the Agenda 2063, which has been reviewed, our aspiration as Africans. And that's why when we listen to the anthem, I'm sure many of us have some solemn feeling of the African Union uh, 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 anthem today. I can tell you many of the states we have worked, even though we have all those Lome declarations, we have the African Charter on Democracy and Good Governance, and many other policy instruments, we have not been able to rectify, domesticate, the, or take real implementable actions. The adoption and implementation of that, the experience is that nearly 95% of these member states are lagging behind in terms of sustainable development, the MGG goals, because of unconstitutional change of government. These are the problematic we face. So the question then is, apart from the work our, city, our head of state are doing, the ECOWAS Commission is doing, and this institutional mechanism, what can we do as non-state actors? What can we as civil society, what can we as religious sector, the religious, I'm very happy that the interface-based colleagues are all here. How can we mobilize and come into a collective action to ensure that we prevent and respond to unconstitutional change? Next slide. So, as I did say, some of the challenges are still here. The reversal of the gain, democratization, I can tell you, UNDP has done a survey and many other uh, uh, the African Union has also said it. even the APRM, the African Governance Report 2023, clearly the perceptions of it suggest that our people are yearning for democracy. They are, in terms of opportunity cost, do they prefer democracy to unconstitutional change of government? The good news is that all the perceptions of it point to the fact that even our local communities, the citizens, prefer democratic governance. I want to commend NIPS and its management and CASID for this particular forum. And I think it will be a far reaching, it will come out at the end of the day with far reaching 
recommendations that will be applied across all West Africa. On behalf of the National Institute, the Alumni Association will bring you goodwill and commend this particular initiative. Deliberations during the extensive technical sessions, presentation of draft program, reviews and endorsements, interactive discussions and recommendations were far-reaching and fruitful as brought to bear at the press conference. Um, we have done this as a collaboration between the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, Kuru, Nigeria, a think tank that um, has been set up by the uh, Federal Republic of Nigeria. We also have the Regional Center for Governance and Security and Policy Initiative, which is based in Syria alone. We also have the Dantier Center for Good Leadership and Journalism, which is based in Abuja and Kano. We also have our colleagues that have joined us with um, enormous support from CAICIT, Portugal, the Dialogue Center. With us here, we're um, representative of the EU and um, representatives from ECOWAS and representative from um, the AU, ECOSOC. We also had with us the um, representative of the uh, Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Nigeria. We want to thank colleagues who are joining us from other parts you know, of West Africa and um, and also uh, West Africa, specifically from Ghana, Sierra Leone, and the rest. You will notice that from the, and the names of the partners that I've mentioned, we have NIPS as a public sector institution, which is a think tank. Other partners are civil society organizations. Indeed, we are quite happy that it's not just civil society that is doing um, this work, but also the public um, sector is also involved. And this is a good point to start, where we have both government and civil society working to achieve um, goals and targets you know, for the West African region. And indeed, what I have said earlier is we are committed towards um, dialogue which will address issues around preventing and responding to unconstitutional changes of government in West Africa. And so today's launch is basically um, devoted uh, to that and subsequent developments um, would, would, would also address this. It will interest you to know that the um, consortium, which is basically on research, on advocacy, um, was formed in 2020. And since then, we have been um, working to see that we have this launch um, today. A little bit about the National Institute. Um, we are a think tank, and we believe in knowledge production and we think that we can assist and work with the consortium um, to provide these um, uh, strong support with knowledge production. Uh, ordinarily, we uh, say we are thinking for government. And so what we do is to relate um, with the government of our own country, who also relates with government, governments in West Africa and other parts of the, I mean, and, and, and the continent generally with some ideas. And we think that this is an opportunity uh, that we can leverage on to, to reach governments in the, uh, the sub-region. I would like to give you brief info about what we do at the Regional Center for Governance and Security Policy Initiative and who we are. It's a regional center which have to which involves a multidisciplinary team of, I won't say ex-servicemen, 
But those of us who have been in national security, the intelligence services, the defense and security sector, and the judiciary, the rule of law, I'm very pleased that, for example, the former assistant like the general of customs, uh, uh, my brother Benjamin Abbe is here, who is part of the consortium. This tells you, as a retired uh, um, senior officer, customs person, is still being used into how do we deal with uh, the, We have many of them there. As I speak, General Karanja and others in Kenya are part of this. So we have that reservoir of human resource capital. Those who have served as first commanders, whether through the multinational joint task force or the African Union mission in Somalia, or the Sahel. So we have come together with police commissioner formers. We have formed this entity together to work with academics and think tanks to advance that, including the role of the media. So that, that is how we are. We deliver a lot on defense and security sector reforms on the continent. As I speak, we are also part of the African Union, African Security Sector Network. Now, sometimes people ask some of us, after 20 years working on defense and security sector reform, why are we seeing military coups back again? So sometimes I push my head back and say, well, maybe we have to re-justice our security sector reform and governance arrangement. This is why we have integrated that into this program. But let me bring you to today's event, why we are here and why we are working in partnership with our colleagues. We think from this meeting, today's meeting, there are certain key takeaways for the regional center uh, we, we note, and which we are very pleased with, because NIPS is our host, and we are coming in, flying in to, uh, to get these activities together. What we get out of this meeting to this uh, is that, one, there is increased recognition from all the speakers that UCG is a major threat to consolidating our democracy, political security, and economic stability within, the, within ECOWAS, and then on the African continent again. So the impact, the threat and risk to political, economic, socioeconomic thing, cost of living, the rising cost of living, economic hardship, where you hear many states are planning protest, including our own capital city, Nigeria. So this is an issue. So we think there's a recognition that it is, a, it is a phenomenon that is very risky and can undermine democratic consolidation, the gains we have made so far. International Dialogue Center was founded in 2012. It's an intergovernmental organization uh, composed of three member states as well as the Holy Sees. Those member states are Spain, Saudi Arabia, and Austria, as well as the Holy Sees as a founding observer. We also count uh, with a board of directors composed of representatives, high-level representatives from the five major world uh, faith traditions, uh, including Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Judaism. And this uh, uh, dual governance structure uh, composed by our council of parties, those are the member states I just mentioned, as well as the, as well as, as well as the board of directors, ensure that our initiatives always take into account uh, interreligious dialogue uh, as its main uh, driving force. And uh, we believe that the involvement of religious actors in any development initiative will mean that that development initiative is more inclusive and uh, more sustainable. Uh, the population of the world, about 80% of it, identifies with uh, some sort of faith, uh, some sort of religion. That is particularly the case uh, in the African continent. Uh, and uh, in the region of West Africa, where its citizens will identify with one, uh, one particular faith community or the other. Uh, therefore, we consider it uh, crucial to involve them uh, in, in initiatives uh, that serve the, the interest of the citizenry. Uh, religion in its institutionalized form uh, forms a, a fundamental part of civil society. Uh, we've been working, uh, Kaiseed has been working in Nigeria now for uh, close to a decade. Uh, we've been working closely with civil society actors as well as with government actors. Uh, case in point, the National Institute for Peace and Security Studies, uh, with uh, whom we are now partnering on this important initiative. Uh, we have uh, also, one of our main uh, successes here in Nigeria has been the creation of uh, the Interfaith Dialogue Forum for Peace, 
we also have uh, has been present here uh, in its uh, leadership um, to support this initiative and will be a uh, main part of the steering committee as a, as a fundamental member of the steering committee in order to ensure the inclusion of religious actors and religious voices uh, given the capacity that religious actors have um, to engage with their communities because of the trust and access that they that they enjoy, uh, they are uh, effectively supposed to be non nonpartisan and apolitical, and therefore uh, have the capacity to bring together uh, uh, the collective and uh, and the the communities that they that they represent. The frequency of the steering committee meetings will be timed to be at key milestones set out in the program plan or quarterly to be decided during the first steering committee meeting.